Welcome to those who've just joined. Welcome everybody to this uh, eerie special session um, in honor of the uh, latest ERC grants laureates. Uh, my name is Simon Dietz. Uh, I'm at the London School of Economics uh, and it's my pleasure to chair this session. So I'm joined uh, this morning by uh, the three uh, grants laureates. They were announced yesterday. Uh, uh, they are Elena Verdolini, Uri Fagner, and Emanuele Campilio. Uh, and uh, in this morning's session, uh, they're going to have an opportunity to present their research to you. Uh, I, we'll start with Emanuele, and then we'll go to Elena, and lastly, Ulrich. Uh, each of them will present for around 20 minutes, maybe a bit longer, and then we'll have a Q&A session at the end of each talk. And then in the last half an hour of the session, we're going to have a panel discussion about the whole ERC process. So at the end of it, you should uh, know everything you need to know to win one of these grants uh, and make it a really hard job for uh, the awards panels next year. So that's how the session is going to run. Um, if you would like to ask a question, uh, please um, either type it into the chat or put your hand up. Uh, we'll try to not to uh, interrupt the speakers during their research presentations, although if you have an urgent question of clarification, type it into the chat. Uh, and when it comes to the Q&A after each talk, um, I will moderate that. So I'll ask, I'll ask you in turn to, to unmute yourselves and ask your questions. Okay, so that's how it's going to work. Uh, then uh, that's it from me. Uh, and I'm very pleased to hand over to my former colleague, Emanuele Campiglio. Emanuele, welcome. Uh, please share your screen now and um, start your presentation. All right, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Simon. Um, can you confirm that you see my screen? I can, thank yeah, you. Great. So uh, thank you very much and thanks to IRI as well for organizing this session. So my project is called uh, uh, SMOOTH, Sustainable Finance for a Smooth Low Carbon Transition. Uh, it's a starting grant. Uh, it was developed at my current uh, institution, the Vienna University of Economics and Business, but then it will be hosted by my future um, uh, academic institution, the University of Bologna with uh, the European Institute on Economics and the Environment, where also Elena is based as a, a partner uh, of the project. So the motivation of the project is the following. Um, we know that we want the global economic system to transition to low carbon technologies, and we know that uh, current investment patterns are not aligned with climate stability objectives. So we will need to shift investment flows from, from high carbon to low carbon activities. And second, we want this shift to take place in an ordered, non-disruptive, smooth uh, manner. Uh, we want to avoid um, episodes of instability and excessive costs. And um, there might be some unavoidable trade-offs between these two objectives. So a rapid transition might inevitably involve some, some economic costs and a smooth transition might inevitably involve some climate costs. But uh, the overarching aim of the project is to try to understand to what extent and how these two objectives can be achieved at the same time, can be compatible. Um, in order to address this research question, uh, I will break things down into three main units of analysis. So first of all, I will study the criteria according to which investors decide the carbon intensity of their investments. Uh, second, I will analyze the macrofinancial implications of a low carbon transition with a particular focus on, on possible uh, uh, sources and transmission channels of disruptions. And third, I want to understand what we can do about it. So what policies can be implemented to facilitate a smooth and rapid low carbon transition. So now what I will do is I will go through each of these points, um, explaining more in detail what I'm planning on doing. And also when available and when relevant, I will also um, uh, present some uh, ongoing and preliminary work. Um, 
and I apologize in advance, I will have to be brief, of course, uh, due to, to time restrictions, but I'm happy for um, us to uh, uh, chat about more in detail later. Right, so investment choices. So how do economic agents decide the carbon intensity of their investment choices? And by investments here, I mean two things. I mean uh, investments, physical investments in new productive capital stocks by non-financial firms and financial investments uh, by financial firms into financial assets, stocks, flows, uh, loans, uh, bonds, and so on. Uh, so these two things, these two uh, choices are linked and sometimes they're carried out by the same economic agents, but they're, they do respond to different um, uh, criteria. So they need to be treated separately. And in this context, I have two main objectives. So the first is um, I will uh, try to capture the current expectations and sentiments of investors uh, concerning the speed and shape of the coming low carbon transition. And I also want to understand how these expectations are formed. And second, um, I want to understand um, how these expectations are then internalized into the investment decision process where a number of other factors might also play a role. And in particular, I will focus on some uh, institutional and behavioral dimensions that might create obstacles to the shift from high to low carbon uh, investments. So for instance, to give you an, a simple example, uh, the, 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 the tendency of the financial system to reward professional performance uh, uh, according to uh, returns in the very short term. Right? This is providing uh, uh, an incentive to go high carbon despite maybe asset managers might have certain expectations uh, regarding the transition that might uh, be rationally uh, aligning them to some other behavior. Um, this, methodologically speaking, will be mainly based on a large-scale survey of uh, investors with some uh, interviews, some uh, small-scale experiments. There is a large literature, of course, on this in behavioral economics and behavioral finance. Uh, to my knowledge, these concepts and techniques have uh, not really been uh, applied to the low carbon transition questions. Uh, so there is a prominent exception here, which is a, a recent paper on the review of financial studies. Um, but also I, I, I noticed um, uh, that at Erie this year, there was another paper by Gucci et al that tries to do something similar um, that I was not aware of. So probably I'm, uh, I'm also missing something in this literature. Uh, here, the only preliminary work uh, that I have is this uh, uh, paper with uh, Ramona Vender, and uh, there, uh, there, is a, there is a survey of around 80 asset management professionals uh, where um, we try to understand what, uh, to what extent reputational hurting is affecting the decision uh, to include or exclude ESG dimensions into investment choices. Uh, but this is the part of the project in which I have uh, uh, less to show and um, uh, more work is needed in this direction. Uh, then the second point uh, that I mentioned were uh, transition costs. Um, even in this case, there is a large literature in climate economics uh, that looks at uh, GDP costs of mitigation policies. However, traditionally, this type of literature doesn't um, uh, include the macro, the financial system. Um, and this is one of the main objectives of, of this project, to, to try to uh, uh, expand um, the, the literature going, the, the, the research field going in this direction. And uh, what I want to understand here is, in particular, uh, where possible macro financial disruptions could originate from, uh, in, along the transition process, uh, how they might be transmitted to the rest of the socioeconomic system and what kind of effects can we, can we um, uh, uh, expect, um, both on the socioeconomic dynamics and on the transition dynamics itself. And finally, um, I want to understand, of course, uh, what policies could be implemented. Uh, so I will design some policy experiments and see whether it is possible to mitigate these risks uh, through different types of policy packages. In this case, um, the methodology is based on, on two main uh, approaches. On one side, network analysis, and on the other side, um, dynamic uh, macrofinancial modeling. So let me 
tell you a few things about these. Um, so network analysis. Um, there is um, a rapidly expanding literature looking at financial networks and how these might be affected uh, by climate change or transition uh, dynamics. So these are just a couple of papers that were presented this year um, uh, at, at Erie, uh, looking at financial networks. What is currently missing is a similar perspective using production networks. So there is some work on physical capital stranding, but to my knowledge, never looking at the systemic perspective. And this is, for instance, something that um, we're currently doing in this Capital Stranding Cascades paper uh, with the, the co-authors that you see here, where we developed this methodology to take multi-regional input-output uh, databases and compute these uh, marginal uh, stranding multipliers that might be triggered by defossilization or decarbonization, depending on what, whether you want to look at the supply or the demand side. So, to give you just a, a, a taste, um, these are some of the results that we have um, for um, the supply side perspective. So in this case, we impose a unitary shock on the production of uh, uh, fossil fuels. So it's a, uh, it's a production uh, um, uh, shock. And then we study how uh, these uh, create stranding in other sectors and other countries. So what you, look, what you see here, for instance, is the country aggregation. So for instance, uh, you have a unitary shock in the Canadian fossil industry. So you have a, a $1 less of primary inputs going into, into the production of fossil fuels or you have uh, $1 more of taxes applied on the production of fossil fuels in Canada, and um, this creates a, a relevant stranding effect in the US, for instance, and uh, Australia creates uh, in, in China, and so on. We can also disaggregate uh, um, uh, first and second and third round effects. Um, so for instance, here you look at what happens when you have a unitary shock on, on the supply side in the global fossil industry, uh, equally distributed across countries and how it affects other global sectors. So the power industry is the one that uh, suffers most uh, stranding. Um, and, uh, and then you, these are the, let's say the, the, the top ranked uh, sectors in terms of stranding. You can observe how this entangling the first and second round effects is, is interesting because um, uh, certain uh, sectors like the uh, upstream sectors like coke industry and metal industry, they're uh, heavily affected by direct stranding effects, but less by indirect effects, while downstream sectors uh, like real estate and public administration, they're not really affected um, in the first round, but they're heavily affected in the following rounds. So ultimately, they're, they're the stranding multiplier is quite relevant in these sectors, but you, you wouldn't capture it if you only had a, if you didn't have this systemic perspective that I was mentioning. And also we can uh, track how stranding propagates. So in this case, the experiment is a, is a unitary shock in the Australian fossil sector. And uh, we can study how it propagates to other sectors in other countries. In the Australian case, this is Japan and China. These are the most uh, affected sectors. And you can see how then stranding trickles down uh, to other domestic sectors. So for the ERC project, essentially what I'm, trying, uh, what I'm planning on doing is uh, continuing in this direction. Um, the, what I showed you is a supply side perspective. We can do the same uh, for the demand side perspective. So uh, imagining a shock on carbon intensive sectors instead of fossil producing sectors. Uh, we can uh, create a dynamic version. This is in the plans using CGE modeling. And the ultimate objective in this stream of work is to uh, link this production network perspective with the financial network perspective and create a multi-layer uh, analysis of transition risks. Uh, this will um, uh, give me some insights, but, um, but it will bring me up to a certain point. And um, the, the, the majority of the work actually will take place here uh, in the form of dynamic macro-financial modeling. And uh, um, this is a recent but rapidly expanding field uh, that uses a number, a variety of different methodologies. So uh, you can categorize them into 
optimization driven methods and this includes for instance integrated assessment models cge dsg capm uh, these are quite well represented at ERI 2020. Uh, this that you see here is probably a non-comprehensive uh, list of uh, papers that I, uh, that I saw uh, presented uh, this year. So there's a lot going on. Um, the second category is this complexity-driven uh, approach. So um, this includes um, system dynamics, stock flow consistent modeling, agent-based modeling, and there's a lot going on here as well, uh, but this is uh, not really present uh, in, in Erie. It belongs more to other academic communities like ecological economics or evolutionary economics. And these methodologies, they differ in a number of ways, um, even within each category, of course. Uh, but for my purpose, the main difference is how they treat investment decisions and, and expectations. Uh, so the neoclassical workhorse model uh, involves a rational agents that decide um, uh, how to allocate its saving across available investment options after having conducted some form of uh, intertemporal optimization of a welfare function. Uh, while the complexity approach uh, looks at economic agents as embedded in a context of radical uncertainty uh, where no real plans can be made so they prefer to um, uh, uh, rely on adaptive expectations uh, instead of forward-looking expectations and in these models uh, agents do not optimize they satisfy. There was one single paper that I, um, that I um, uh, saw presented here by Sandor Fetal unsatisfying behavior. So what I want to do in, in this paper, given that you know, I, can, I can build on this richness of different methodological approaches, is to use them. And um, I have, for instance, some uh, uh, work, preliminary ongoing and planned work more on the neoclassical side, for instance, um, there is this paper with, with Simon and uh, Frank Vemmans where we um, build a small-scale integrated assessment model analyzing stranding costs uh, under stochastic uncertainty. I'm also planning on doing some uh, um, DSG uh, work uh, looking at carbon bubbles uh, because uh, these methodologies can give insights of some, um, of some uh, form right, on uh, my research question. Um, I'm also planning on uh, 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 building on the complexity-driven uh, approach. And in this case, uh, my main objective is to introduce forward-looking expectations. So you can have um, uh, models in which um, you don't optimize behavior, but you still have forward-looking expectations. You don't have to have adaptive expectations. And uh, for instance, this is something that I've been working on uh, on and off for a few years now. Um, at, in Erie 2017, I was presenting this climate financial bubbles paper uh, where the framework was a stock flow consistent framework, but we were already introducing some forward looking expectations in the way that investors decided the allocation of their saving across uh, available investment options. And we were also introducing some behavioral biases in the form of climate financial apathy, climate blindness. So some behavioral biases that were pushing investors away from low carbon uh, niche emerging technologies and towards incumbent technologies. And we were able to um, uh, study some, some interesting uh, uh, dynamics, uh, disruptive dynamics, right? So we were, we were investigating how the transition might lead to, to recession and in financial instability. We were studying how um, different uh, values of these uh, behavioral biases might lead to more or less uh, stranding, both in financial terms and in physical terms. Um, but the, the model was indeed a very complex. It had a lot of moving parts. And um, so more recent work that I want uh, to briefly show you is something that I'm working on with another uh, group of co-authors where we stripped things down to the very basic and um, we focus on stranding of physical assets um, in the electricity sector 
that makes things easier um, uh, in a number of ways to think about the electricity sector. And uh, uh, firms decide how much uh, to allocate uh, between the two available technological options according to expected profits, where the profit, expected profit function is a function of stranding expectations. In this case, given that we're talking about physical assets, stranding means uh, utilization of the capital stock. And so we assume that they have some central expectation of how uh, utilization of uh, the high carbon capital stock will be in the future, and uh, that they have some uncertainty attached uh, to these expectations, and these inform today's investment decisions. So just for illustrative uh, purposes, uh, we, we have this utilization function. You see, you have uh, um, expected capacity utilization of high carbon capital stock on the y-axis and on the x-axis you have psychological time. That means that we're not really moving from, from now, but we're imagining the future. And uh, we can have different cent central expectations of stranding. They can have um, uh, different depths, different timing, different velocity, different skewness. Uh, essentially, we have a function and we play around with the parameters to, to sensitivity analysis to um, study the parameter space. And then as we move in psychological time, we become more and more uncertain. So we assume that um, there is an error term that is distributed with a certain variance and the variance changes, increases in psychological time uh, in a logistic fashion. So we're building on some psychology re um, uh, research uh, that tells us that with human beings within a, a certain planning horizon, they are fairly sure about what they expect. They might be wrong, but they are quite certain. And then after this limit, this fuzzy planning horizon, then everything becomes um, un sort of unknowable and fuzzy. So uncertainty uh, reaches the, the, maximum, uh, the maximum value. And so we study how this mean, what this means for uh, today's investment decision. And this is, again, just a, for illustration. Um, here you have, for instance, the expected stranding speed. You have the expected depth of the stranding, so how relevant will be the stranding when it happens, and, you, and, and this plots the share of low carbon investments in today investment decisions. So depending on what they expect the stranding to be in the future, they take certain decisions uh, today. And depending also on how uncertain or heterogeneous these expectations are, and depending on how um, long is the planning horizon that they have. And uh, then in time T as well, because things move and they learn, they adapt. Uh, we're taking this planning horizon from uh, this uh, Spiro paper that was published a few years back that is um, really insightful. And um, we, we play around with different scenarios in time T, what could happen and how they react to, um, to certain shocks. But we're able to track both expected and both, let's say, time, chronological time, uh, chronological time and psychological time dynamics. Okay, um, finally, uh, policies. Um, Two minutes left, Emmanuel, is that okay? Yes, uh, I'm almost done. Okay. Uh, so regarding policies, um, we want, I want to study um, what policies can be implemented. And I want to look at carbon pricing, of course, but I also want to look at beyond carbon pricing and in particular at policies targeting financial behavior uh, more specifically. And so um, on one side, I want to understand how the current policies are affecting the carbon intensity of investment decisions. So for instance, the current, uh, the most recent round of quantitative easing by the European Central Bank, what effect is it having on investment decisions? Uh, and also, um, this, of course, is sort of su a supporting work to the modeling work. So this will help me in designing the policy experiment that I will then use into the uh, modeling work. Uh, however, that's not all because, uh, you know, you, you could uh, say, okay, we found that uh, monetary policy should be green and that would uh, mitigate transition costs, but maybe monetary policy cannot be greened because the central bank doesn't have the mandate to adopt promotional measures. 
And so this becomes uh, an institutional governance, uh, almost political science question. And uh, this is the, the last uh, uh, part of, of the project, trying to understand uh, um, uh, how different institutional frameworks might be used or not used to implement certain policies. In this case, methodologically speaking, uh, there will be some empirical analysis and some comparative political analysis. And uh, I, I have some uh, preliminary work from, from last year where, for instance, we're looking at European Union and China, and we discuss how uh, the different institutional and governance frameworks, like, so for instance, the uh, 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 connection between central banks and government uh, uh, or how uh, the public uh, sphere controls private financial dynamics, these type of institutional features, they then um, uh, lead to certain policy approaches to address the same issue that is sustainability. Okay, so let me conclude. Um, so Smooth is um, a five-year project. Uh, it will start in September, as I was saying. It will have these three pillars, um, capturing and understanding uh, transition sentiments and expectations of investors, um, model the macro financial transition dynamics, and identify policy and institutions to mitigate transition risks. Uh, the host institutions will be the University of Bologna and the RFF uh, CMCC, European Institute on Economics and the Environment, which is based in Milano. And uh, let me conclude by stressing um, uh, that I would be very um, interested in uh, exploring options for uh, collaborations and visits either in Bologna or Milano or elsewhere. But um, if you um, have uh, some interest uh, in any of the uh, points of the research agenda that, out that I outlined, I would be very, very happy to um, hear from you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Simon. Thank you, Emanuele. And uh, well, I, I, and I hope that your project goes smoothly. Um, now, uh, we have time for a few minutes of questions. So if anybody would like to ask a question, please put your hand up uh, or uh, type it into the chat box. And maybe just to get things started, I don't mind asking a, a question or two. Um, now, Emanuele, you're one of the few people, I think, who's able to move between the neoclassical field and the complexity field. Um, and I just wonder if, if, you know, I'd just be interested in your reflections on that as one of the few people who can operate in both fields. Where do you feel that the, the, the comparative strengths and weaknesses are? Um, well, yeah. Um... I think um, both methodologies, well, it's, it's re reductive to say both because of course within uh, each field you have uh, many different methodological approaches. They can give you insights on uh, different problems. Um, I mean, I guess that the main distinction there is um, what kind of uh, approach you have to the question. So a normative approach would often suggest a more neoclassical approach because that would allow you to uh, identify the optimal paths, right? To identify what is the right behavior, what is the right uh, cost of carbon, um, uh, what is the optimal policy and so on. Um, while if you're not interested in the normative question, but more uh, to the, uh, to the positive, you, you want to look at the positive question, descriptive question, that is you want to, um, say something about how the system actually behaves and what we can expect under different potential scenarios, then the complexity approach um, has some uh, value added because um, uh, that's, that's what, it, what it is for, right? To you kind they, of mimic. Do you think they work differently at different scales? Is there, is there, are, there, are there sort of other, uh, you know, optimal scales for where the different conceptions of behavior work better or worse? Um, yeah, I think so. Um, I guess that the main uh, scale different here is that the complexity driven approach, uh, as, as uh, I'm calling it now, um, is uh, able to give insights on the um, misalignment between micro and macro, right? So emergent, 
emerging behaviors, feedback loops, um, when you have uh, some disconnection between uh, the, the, what is optimal, for instance, at the individual agent level, uh, then creating uh, undesired macro dynamics like the paradox of thrift, for instance, uh, that is quite well representable uh, using stock flow consistent modeling and so on. And uh, from a financial perspective, I guess that um, also the, that that uh, technique has a, has an advantage because of the um, uh, because they have a long tradition in uh, modeling uh, uh, balance sheets, but dynamic balance sheet behavior. So you know credit creation by by the banking system, while often for the reason of. Uh, you know, for the desire of analytical tractability, you know, classical models tend to reduce um, the complexity. Um, and uh, for instance, this is usually not included, the, the credit creation uh, part. Right. Thanks. Thanks. Sorry if that was a tough question to put. <laughs> don't find yeah. it here. Um, we probably, we, we do have time for one more question, if anybody would like to ask one. I don't want to monopolize it. Uh, oh, Elena, you have your hand up. Is there somebody, did somebody else want to? Also, both Elena and Ulrich. So, um, uh, Elena, why don't you go first? Oh, you're on mute. Sorry. I was just uh, wondering uh, um, very quickly, what is the part uh, of this work, uh, you know, program work that worries you the most and where you think you're going to be scratching your head? And uh, um, let me just, before you answer, let me just tell you, I will be asking you exactly the same question exposed in five years, right? So I want to see, um, yeah, so that, that's just for yeah. the record. Uh, I guess now the, 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 the modeling part is, uh, is definitely the most worrisome uh, part um, because um, uh, in a way, this is all very new. In all, in all of these fields that I mentioned, the methodolog methodologies, um, everything is, uh, is very new. And, um, you know, even at, at Erie, I've been tracking uh, uh, during years, and uh, now there is a, a thing called environmental macroeconomics. But first, it was not really present. It was more like growth um, and um, technological change. So that was, and now there is an interest in financial. So I don't have that many um, examples to build on. I'm kind of moving in uncharted territory and there's a lot of exciting research being conducted by others as well, but this is all very new and um, this is probably the, um, the most challenging part, yes. Um, no, um, I think we should probably move on, Ulrich, if you don't mind, if you, if you want to ask the question in the chat to Emanuele or, or later or whatever, um, I think we should, we, should, we should move on in the interest of time. So uh, thank you very much again, Emanuele, for introducing us to your project. Uh, our next speaker is Elena Bergolini. Elena, please go ahead and share your screen. Hi, um, thank you very much. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, yeah. perfect. Sorry. Um, yeah, so hopefully you will, you're, you're seeing uh, my, my presentation. Thank you so much. I, I'm very um, happy to be here in this session, uh, uh, not only because it gives me a, a chance to showcase the project, but also because it finally gives me a chance to understand what Emanuele will be doing, right, as well as, uh, as Ulrich. So it's nice to know what else is going on. So my project uh, is also an ERC starting grant. It's called uh, 2D4D, and that stands for Disruptive Digitalization for Decarbonization. Uh, it's going to be hosted uh, jointly at the Università degli Studi di Brescia uh, and uh, at the RFF CMCC European Institute on Economics and the Environment um, within CMCC. <clears throat> so, um, I mean, my presentation is gonna be about uh, uh, the vision that I have uh, for this project that hopefully um, will uh, uh, come through over the next five years. And I think I don't have to um, tell you guys, I'm sort of preaching to the choir here when I say that um, I, I think also Emanuele's presentation started with a similar sentence. Uh, we must uh, uh, curb uh, greenhouse gas emissions swiftly if we want to limit climate change impacts uh, on uh, economic on ecosystems, on economies uh, and, and on societies. Uh, um, and uh, um, 
what matters here is that the decarbonization pro process actually needs to be shaped and promoted. It's not something that uh, it's happening on its own, as we all, uh, are all uh, painfully aware. And uh, the way to shape this process is through appropriate policies that will provide incentives and guide uh, um, citizens, uh, firms, uh, and institutions in the right direction. So uh, the transition towards net zero um, is actually um, bringing about a large number of technological challenges. And this is exactly the place where my previous research lies. So I was uh, sort of uh, born as a, uh, an environmental economist with a focus on innovation dynamics. So I've had, uh, I have uh, uh, quite some experience uh, in, in the past decade over looking at innovation trends, uh, innovation, uh, you know, the speed of diffusion of technologies. Um, as well as, uh, you know, reasons decreasing in cost, expectation about the cost decrease of, uh, of low carbon technologies. And this is really where, where, I, where I build part of my, uh, the, the, the first part of my, of my career. Now, <clears throat> the one thing that I came to realize, as many of you probably and many others in the field, is that even when ca low carbon technologies are available, they actually diffuse very slowly. So you can have a technology that um, is very cheap, that makes sense to adopt and use, but still we're facing uh, a number of barriers. And uh, so to me, that means that arguably the biggest challenge ahead of us is actually not a technological one. It's not about how many technologies we're going to be putting on the table, how many of them we will be able to lower costs for. But uh, uh, socioeconomic barriers actually, to me, play the most crucial role in this perspective. And I think that you, um, I mean, um, we've, we've witnessed uh, over the past couple of years uh, an interesting uh, uh, dynamic, which is, um, uh, you know, the Fridays for Future movement on the one hand, uh, making the world aware about the need to, to, to lower emissions, but on the other hand, resistance has been more and more apparent uh, in a number of places uh, um, around the world. So what, what does, why is this important for my project? This is important in my project because socioeconomic conditions are actually, uh, actually matter a lot. They matter uh, in the sense that depending on which world you think about, you are going to end up having different pathways for carbon emissions. And here I'm just showing one simple graph that shows you how the colored lines, which is uh, uh, net CO2 emissions, change depending on which world you live in whether you are in a rapid growth scenario, whether you are in a scenario where regions are uh, rival with each other, whether you can strike a middle of the road or whether the world is gonna be completely unequal and, uh, or whether the world is gonna push for, for sustainability. And so what, uh, what uh, happens is that um, a number in, in, current, uh, in current scenarios, uh, in current um, pathway development, this, uh, um, these framework conditions are actually fixed and in, over the last years, uh, what has become to happen is that uh, they consider more than one scenario, right? Uh, share the socioeconomic pathway, as they are called. This socioeconomic pathways, so the framework conditions in which decarbonization happens, is actually, are actually not uh, uh, exogenous. They are strongly influenced, and they're strongly influenced uh, for the matter related to this project, project by, digital by the digital revolution. Now, let me just give you a different example, um, which is the COVID situation, completely different, um, um, you know, uh, completely different, it comes from a completely different place, but COVID will have a, a, a crucial impact on the carbonization, and COVID did not actually impact our technological ability in the present time, and it will probably have a, a just dent uh, it will dent only innovation dynamics. What will happen is that it will make it harder for people to accept uh, the limitations, you know, the sacrifices linked with uh, decarbonization because these people will have to face other types of sacrifices, other types, I mean, economic uh, um, difficulty arising from uh, the, the pandemic. So um, the digital revolution actually um, influences uh, the possibility of decarbonization. And so uh, it does so in different ways. So the most obvious one, uh, the one that, um, uh, start, that people started getting interested in a few years back, it actually is actually the fact that digital technologies affect emission pathways. And they affect emission pathways in two ways. The first one, we've read it you know, in certain articles in the press, the digital technologies consume an insane amount of energy as we digitalize electricity uh, demand increases, right? But there is also another countervailing 
uh, fact, which is uh, digital technologies can help become uh, more efficient. They can increase energy efficiency because they allow to coordinate. They are crucial, for example, in the deployment of renewable technologies and so on and so forth. And to be honest, the net impact on emissions of digital technology is not yet, uh, is not yet clear. We cannot say whether uh, digital technologies will necessarily increase the demand for energy or not. But there is a second uh, channel, which to me is very important and linked uh, uh, very closely with what I talked to you about up to now, which is the social economic impacts that digitalization will have. So digitalization will impact uh, uh, firms, it will impact the demand for jobs, it will impact the distribution of wealth, it will impact access to resources, access to services. And by doing so, it will shape decarbonization through the framework conditions. So, um, the 2D4D project actually focuses around uh, a, a key question, which is how can we manage the two challenges of decarbonizing and digitalizing so that they're mutually enhancing rather than uh, um, basically mutually destructive. So um, the bigger point is uh, um, when I started writing uh, or thinking about this project is, is to identify what knowledge gaps I believe are there that needs to be filled. And in my opinion, there are, um, there are three types, uh, three major knowledge gaps, three areas where we need uh, more research. Uh, the first one is data on the socioeconomic impacts of digitalization, right? And this includes impact of digitalization on the demand for energy, but it also includes the impact of digitalization on the uh, demand for skill, on trade patterns, okay, on uh, competitiveness of firms, uh, on the demand for labor, on the ability of citizens to access different types of resources. Uh, let me give you an example. As we move uh, uh, more and more uh, towards uh, um, you know, uh, non-ownership of means of transportation, because people can very easily, um, through an app, uh, jump from a public mean of transport onto an e-bike uh, rather than renting a car or grabbing a Uber, um, what happens is that uh, people in cities are generally uh, able to benefit from this uh, change, whereas regional um, areas, um, um, non-central areas uh, uh, or suburbs um, have a, hard, a much harder time. Uh, this is also true with respect to uh, citizens of different courts. For instance, uh, um, if transportation were to be completely digitalized and uh, in, in such a way, I don't think uh, uh, my dad would ever be able to, uh, to leave the house because he doesn't know how to use an app. So um, these considerations actually um, will impact uh, the ability of citizens to access uh, services. The second, the second gap that, that I was able to identify, it's a methodological one. We actually lack a method to link the digitalization debate uh, and the decarbonization debate. Um, in no truth, there has been a lot of work and, and there is a lot of very exciting frontier research work on the impact of, uh, um, on the socioeconomic impacts of digitalization, which actually has started uh, becoming more and more apparent over the last uh, um, two to three years, uh, particularly. Um, the, the thing that is very apparent is that this uh, uh, line of research is completely uh, separated from the line of research on decarbonization. So these are two research streams that have uh, currently very, very little connection with the exception of consideration for impact on energy demand. And uh, the same can be said uh, if you look at the policy landscape. Uh, no country addresses in the same, uh, um, in, at the same time, uh, consistently and jointly, the issue of uh, decarbonizing on the one hand and digitalizing on the other hand. And I think this is actually an important missed opportunity. And then the third gap um, is uh, uh, the fact that uh, consists of the fact that we lack policies, uh, we lack uh, the identification of the appropriate uh, policy tools and policy portfolios to ensure that digitalization acts as an enabler rather than a barrier for decarbonization. So around these three gaps, um, I, I sort of shaped the research project and I'm hoping to be able to at least shed some light, uh, uh, an initial light uh, on, uh, on all three of them. So let me tell you how I plan to do this. So I focused the project um, on, uh, on three highly disruptive digital technologies. And these are additive manufacturing, mobility as a service, and ambient intelligence in buildings. 
And the reason why I focused on these three is because they are crucial. They represent interesting case studies in three very hard to decarbonize sectors. These sectors currently uh, account for more than three quarters of CO2 emissions, uh, uh, for sure in the European Union and um, more so outside of the European Union. These three sectors are industry, transportation, and buildings. These three um, uh, technologies also put us uh, uh, um, in front of very different challenges, right? Additive manufacturing is the ability to uh, localize production and could be perceived uh, as a good way to gain back some comparative advantage, which Europe has lost over the past uh, couple of decades to uh, countries outside of Europe. It could be a way to promote high skill labor in Europe and reduce transportation costs. Mobility as a service actually um, uh, is, is more concerned uh, with, uh, um, with other, I mean, raises other types of questions, such as, for instance, equity and the ability of all citizens to access this type of mobility in a, in a consistent way. It is also um, a type of technology that is more demand-based uh, rather than uh, um, focusing on, on, on production. And the last technology that I decided to focus on, which is ambient intelligence, actually raises some very crucial legal and uh, governance questions. Because the idea of living in a house that is very efficient and can reduce demand for energy, but where uh, potentially people could hack in your house and know exactly where you are and what you're doing at every single moment of time, um, are, I mean, uh, understandably raises some, uh, some important legal concerns. So let me tell you what, um, um, I told you what I'm gonna. I'm hoping to focus on, and let me tell you what I uh, what I hope to to um, accomplish over the next five years. So the first phase of the project is rounded about around uh, um, is centered around uh, uh, data collection and analysis. So what I plan to do is I plan to work on the three different technologies in the three different sectors, and using um, different uh, uh, methods and approaches, which include uh, data collection. Um, um, analysis of secondary data and so on and so forth to understand what are the technical and non-technical uh, challenges and impacts that this technology can have on the specific sector, right? The second phase um, is about uh, uh, summarizing and trying to, um, to understand how these sector-specific insights actually affect the framework conditions for the, the for decarbonization, which basically means enriching the shared socioeconomic pathways with strong consideration for digital dynamics uh, and uh, for digital um, for uh, digital patterns um, in addition to this the idea is that the knowledge gathered in the first phase would help uh, um, generate or, or feed into um, uh, modeling tools which are specific for industry mobility and buildings in such a way as to being able to specify digitalization dynamics in these three uh, um, industry sectors in a better way following that the idea is to link this knowledge with um, a large-scale integrated assessment model in such a way as to be able to generate um, uh, pathways that are robust to digitalization dynamics and uh, as a result of this, and why would I want to engage in this process? Well, my hope is to be able, by doing this, to focus uh, on, uh, on policy options and on the possibility of designing policy portfolios that can support uh, um, decarbonization in the years to come. Um, what I plan to do in the project is actually to rely on a very broad toolkit of complementary methods. Uh, qualitative comparative analysis, econometrics, big data analytics, expert elicitation and modeling. And uh, um, the reason why I'm able to source from such a large uh, pool of methods is actually that I have background experience in, in a number of them over the past uh, decade, but also that I um, have been uh, spending my time with a number of other people at the Institute uh, that uh, have complementary uh, capacity or abilities with respect to my own. And I refer here specifically at integrated assessment modeling, which is not something you can reinvent yourself to do in over time. So basically what my hope is uh, for, for the project it, is that it will lead to new data and knowledge uh, regarding the technical and socioeconomic impacts of digitalization. And this hopefully will be sector and geographically differentiated. Uh, it will hopefully uh, be able to put on the table new modeling tools 
and uh, identify no regret policy portfolios. And uh, the idea of engaging in this pro uh, process is actually to um, uh, be able to impact uh, both uh, uh, scholars in the academic debate, but also policy makers, uh, uh, you know, international organizations such as, for instance, uh, the IPCC, World Bank, and so on and so forth, as well as private actors by generating new knowledge. So, um, Actually, this is the slide that gives me most pleasure, I have to say, at this moment. I, I, I was able to sign the grant agreement during the COVID lockdown, and I can now say that this project has indeed or will indeed receive funding from the European Research Council under a grant agreement. And um, I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Elena. So we have some time for questions. If anybody would like to ask a question, please put your hand up or type it into the chat. And Ulrich, you've got your hand up, so go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thanks for a very interesting um, presentation, Elena. Um, I, I was wondering uh, about one thing, um, since you, you brought up transportation as an example, um, mobility services. Um, and so on, you know, if you want to take this to integrated assessment, uh, you need to consider two things, right? You need to consider how much carbon emission mitigations will actually bring about. That's not clear that this will always be uh, uh, a, a plus um, if people use autonomous cars to, you know, travel to their workplace for two hours uh, in the morning and another two hours in the evening while working in the, in the car. Um, that's it's not that clear that it will lead to emissions reductions. Um, so there you will have to do, um, you know, modeling assumptions and so on and so forth. But the other thing that I was also curious about is since you mentioned the cost of servers uh, and the energy costs and, and, and that aspect, um, that sort of external cost of the digitalization, is it possible to attribute the cost of, say, a mobility app in an economic sense um rather than just an accounting sense you know what what is it what's the increment in uh, energy costs and uh, what's the incremental contribution to climate change by introducing i don't know a mobility um, services app that you may yeah. consider in your proposal no and i think yeah this is a it's a very good question for a number of reasons, among which I think it, it points directly to one of the challenges of thinking about the future in terms of decarbonization pathways, which is um, integrated assessment models are very um, uh, high scale, macro, right? And, uh, but really what is going to matter in the next 30 years is individual behavior and the way in which you use certain things. And this is hard enough when you think about firms, uh, let alone when you start thinking about single consumers, right? Each of which has their own preferences and whatever and whatnot. Well, the, 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 um, I agree. Uh, I think that uh, um, this is a crucial question. I am not sure that you would be able to specifically, I mean, it, it would be a really interesting thing to be uh, finding a way to do what you're asking for, but I have a counter question for you on that matter. So, which is the following. Most of us, I don't know you, but I travel by, uh, by metro to work, okay? And uh, uh, everybody on the metro is looking at their cell phone, okay? They're not necessarily uh, looking at the transportation app, but they always have their cell phones in their hands, okay? So there is also a, a consideration that we need to keep in, in mind, which is, does the app really necessarily consume more energy than people just using the cell phone for any other, uh, for any other function, right? So if, I think it's a very interesting question, in fact, whether, again, the net impact of this is, is bigger or, um, or smaller. And then on the servers, I think, I mean, I did some work on the rebound effect uh, years back, uh, looking at, uh, um, at this topic. And to me, it's really interesting that I think um, this issue of uh, consuming energy is very relevant in a fossil world, okay? Because rebound effect happens when you still rely primarily on fossil. Now, if every one of us were to have zero carbon technologies, right? Not, not, neg not net zero, but zero carbon technologies like solar panels, right? Then this consideration about consumption of servers 
would be less, uh, I, I would argue, less problematic, right? So I think that there are a number of things that need, that need disentangling. I, I don't know, everywhere I look, I find yet another question, and I only have five years, you know, and so many people that I can hire. So for me, the challenge would be that of, of picking a line of questioning that actually, you know, to implement this, a line of questioning that can actually bring different insights together and when you add them the value added is, is bigger than the sum of the parts to me right but i i agree that this is a good uh, yeah it's something to worry about okay we've got a short question uh from uh the audience so and i think this is a, a clarification question elena really but can you give an example of additive manufacturing what do you mean by that yes yes i have a perfect example which is um if so additive manufacturing is generally what you uh, what you name 3d printing okay broadly speaking the best example is 3d printing and the relevance for instance of 3d printing in the last year has been proven in a paper which i think was published actually a few years back that uh, was able to estimate that for instance a u.s uh, aircraft right could, uh, um, if parts of a US aircraft, certain parts were 3D printed as opposed to produced uh, normally, you could reduce uh, uh, fuel consumption by between nine and 13%. And the reason for this is because 3D printing allows you to do this uh, special forms, which are, um, are empty, right? It's not full uh, material, but it's actually po uh, different polygons, right? That increase the strength of the structure, but make it lighter. So one clear example for me is 3D printing. Imagine if everybody of us could have a 3D printer in the house and they wouldn't need to go on, you know, ikea.com to order a shelf. They could just decide that they want it their own way, right? So, and, and I think that this is, I mean, at least to me, it sounds a little bit like fun, uh, you know, uh, like a, a world, a, a fantasy scientific world, like a, an impossibility, but, but these things are happening. I, I, I know several people who have actually bought a 3D printer so far with, with the poor success because the technology is yet not precise. But <laughs> I have to tell you that my brother spends quite a <laughs> long number of hours trying to get something out of his 3D printer. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I, I have to say, I, I, I usually can't get my wireless printer to print a piece of paper. <laughs> so, uh, um, yeah, I can see the problems. Okay, um, so I think we have time for uh, one more question. Uh, and uh, I don't think there are any hand, hands up um, or questions in the chat. But uh, Emanuele, did you have a question? Uh, yes, uh, a small thing, actually. I was wondering... Um, when you were speaking, Elena, first of all, thank you. That that was uh, really interesting. Um, it, it reminded me of uh, a conversation, of a debate that is ongoing um, in several European countries, but I know for a fact in Italy, about these COVID-related tracking apps, uh, where there is a strong backlash against um, the idea of uh, being uh, um, s s tracked in this case, but I was linking it at the ambient intelligence that you were uh, referring to where, you know, you could be hacked, you could be controlled and so on. Uh, are you planning on um, <clears throat> doing something around these uh, dimensions? Yeah, so the uh, one of the, actually, in fact, I, I think it's interesting that one of the issues that people raised uh, um, in my interview was the fact that ambient intelligence, uh, I mean, what they question is whether I had the ability and the background to actually address this type of questions, because this is not necessarily my line of work as an economist, but I think it has a lot to do with data protection issues, right? And citizens' rights and whatever. So I, 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 I totally think it's an important aspect that is where I would like to go. Some, uh, you know, um, is what I would like to know better, because I think it does, uh, uh, it does matter a lot. On, on this other, uh, I mean, in this case, I also have a counter question, which is the following. I had this exact discussion with a number of people regarding the apps and the fact of being tracked. But what is very unknown to people is that happens every time you click on accept all cookies, okay, in a certain sense. I mean, it's not something, perhaps it's to a, a bigger extent, but I think that there is a false sense that we are not tracked every time we get on a website. And this is completely wrong because they profile you. They perhaps don't know where you exactly are physically, but they profile you, right? So I think that there needs to be also a debate um, uncovering this already existing part of our lives and trying to understand what the delta is with respect to what you are subject to unaware, you know, in an unaware fashion and what the 
the benefit of this type of tracking devices are, right? So I don't think there is a benefit in knowing whether you are currently in your kitchen or in your bathroom, right, with ambient intelligence, but I think there is a benefit in, in situations like COVID, you know, in, in, uh, in understanding where, where people with the, with the virus are so that we can somehow respond to that, right? I, I don't know if I got exactly to your question um, in that respect, but hopefully to a certain extent. All right, good. Um, so I think in the interest of time, uh, we should probably move on to Ulrich Wagner uh, for the third presentation of this session. So uh, thanks again, Elena and Ulrich. Please go ahead and share your screen and go ahead. Thank you, Simon. Thanks everyone for thanks everyone for being here. Can you see the so we can see the screen? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. So I um, I'm going to talk about my ERC consolidator grant. Um, entitled Health, Labor and Environmental Regulation in Post-Industrial Europe. Um, the acronym is HEAL. That was actually the, the fun part of the proposal writing to find a, uh, an acronym. And, um, and this was evaluated by the SH1 panel of the ERC, which is the panel, um, it's a panel comprised of economists um, and business and statistics. It's also uh, a five-year grant, and uh, like the other panelists in this session, I also have a long-standing interest in uh, decarbonization and carbon pricing, especially in the manufacturing sector, but this proposal is actually mainly uh, about air pollution, uh, and uh, air pollution is, is a, a major threat to public health. It um, shortens lives and it increases morbidity. Uh, we're all economists, so we know that air pollution is a negative externality that arises from many economic activities. And uh, to regulate this externality can improve welfare, but the regulation should be based on a sound cost-benefit analysis. Uh, cost-benefit analysis requires the measurement of uh, air pollution damages, and that is, turn, turns out to be challenging for at least three reasons. And the first reason is that to estimate causal impacts of air pollution is difficult because air pollution is not randomly assigned across individuals. The second difficulty arises because firms and individuals respond to regulation in ways that could undermine its effectiveness. And the third difficulty arises because air pollutants travel over long distances so that the impacts are not confined to the place of emission. The aim of my ERC project is to quantify air pollution damages in a framework that addresses all three challenges. Now, as an economist, I've been trained to deal with the uh, first two challenges, causal attribution and behavior, um, but addressing the third one requires me to resort to uh, state-of-the-art methods from at atmospheric chemistry, which is um, uh, one uh, reason, or that's one budget item in my uh, proposal an important one. Uh, and this is important because it's necessary to track pollution all the way from the source to the place of impact. Okay, So this interdisciplinary approach is risky, um, but it offers large payoffs in terms of methodological advances for cost-benefit analysis. Now, the structure of the project is, is basically um, two parts. And the first part has a uh, more of a focus on uh, methodology um, by enhancing spatial detail and causal attribution. And the second part of the proposal uh, has more of a focus on outcomes, new outcomes uh, in the literature on air, air pollution and, and human health. Um, each of these parts contains three or four work packages. And uh, I'd like to um, tell you a little bit about, um, about them in what, in what follows. So part one of the proposal uh, analyzes unintended impacts of CO2 permit trading on public health in Europe. Um, what you can see here in this map is uh, population density in Europe, along with the location of firms and facilities that trade CO2 permits with one another. Now, you know that CO2 doesn't harm human health as such, but it's often emitted jointly with air pollutants that do have health impacts. So I put up an example here. 
um, assume that firm A here in, uh, in Spain, um, the Iberian Peninsula, sells a permit to firm B, that's a CO2 permit, so uh, this trade will be neutral in terms of overall CO2 emissions, but because of joint pollution, um, uh, both firms uh, emit NO2, um, which is an air pollutant, and because firm B is more pollution intensive than firm A, the overall pollution goes up. Okay, so this is non-neutral in terms of co-pollution, this trade. And in addition, this trade shifts pollution to an area where it harms more people because this place is more densely populated than uh, that one over here. So this example suggests that CO2 trading might have large impacts on air quality and public health. Uh, but there's so far no empirical evidence um, on this important question. So what I propose here, what I propose to the ERC is a new framework for spatially explicit exposed analysis of this issue. So um, since I, I present preliminary work on this uh, part one uh, in uh, a session this afternoon, uh, I will not talk more about this part right now, but uh, let, let me advertise this session here. It's taking place today at 3 p.m. The Zoom link is, um, uh, is on the slide. And um, I'll be presenting a paper joined with Dana Kassem at Mannheim at, and uh, Laure Dupreux, who's at Imperial College, on the co-pollution impacts of uh, carbon trading. So this is very much um, summarizing the state of uh, research since the proposal writing and now, which is actually more than, which is about a, a year and a half. So part two of the proposal, uh, like I said, is um, uh, more on the um, outcomes. So it extends the scope of economic damage assessment uh, to long-term and subclinical impacts of air pollution on human health and behavior. And uh, this is new because the, the current state of the research is that it focuses very much on short-term impacts of air pollution, uh, on severe health outcomes such as mortality and hospital admissions. Um, and uh, the outcomes that we consider here are a break new ground in terms of um, providing, for example, the first uh, causal estimates of the impact of air pollution on sick leaves, uh, which is what I'm going to be talking about uh, for the rest of my talk uh, now but I'm also going to analyze long-term health effects uh, based on worker level data that allow me to track the pollution health gradient over time and to identify chronic illness. And finally, I examine whether, or I plan to examine whether people move away from heavily polluted areas in order to um, avoid adverse health impacts. So let me tell you about this um, paper now on um, urban air pollution and sick leaves. And the basic question is um, uh, whether high pollution events increase work absences, okay, or the propensity of people to call in sick. Now this is joint work with Felix Holuk, who is a PhD student here in Mannheim, and uh, Laura Ospido, who is a researcher at the Bank of Spain. And what we see in the data, I'll tell you a little bit about the data uh, on the next slide. But what arises very clearly from that data is a, a positive correlation between sick leaves, which is plotted here on the, on the vertical axis in terms of uh, percentage absence rate and um, the concentration of PM10 in the air, uh, in the ambient air, uh, which is measured in uh, micrograms per cubic meter. And the 24 hour standard being here at 50 micrograms. That's the EU standard. Uh, so, uh, for the rest of my uh, time uh, allocation here today, I will try to convince you that this is actually causation and not just a correlation. So, here's the promised slide on the data. Uh, it's a very extraordinary data set. It's a, a panel data of linked work and health histories for a representative sample of over a million um, social security affiliates in Spain. It covers uh, the time from 2005 until 2014, uh, which was a very um, exciting time in Spain because um, the beginning of the period was marked by the end of the construction boom uh, and the end of the period was marked by the Great uh, Recession. We have a great geographic stratification in that data set. You see on the left uh, all the um, municipalities, there's about 99 of them 
that are uh, covered by our data set. And on the right, you see um, the location of the air quality monitors. Um, this is a national network that provides uh, hourly readings for the main air pollutants. And we match those two into a, a data set that contains uh, more than half a billion worker day observations, which for tractability we organized into uh, just, uh, just over 100 million worker by week observations. So uh, the regression that the baseline regression we run is quite simple. We relate the share of days that uh, a worker living in municipality M is on sick leave uh, in week T to uh, a pollution variable that varies at the city by week level. Then uh, we add weather controls, we add uh, controls for uh, school vacations and bank holidays, for the flu incidents, so all uh, possible observable confounders of um, sick leave rates. Uh, and then we uh, throw in more controls to, um, uh, to control for uh, the things that we don't really observe, such as business cycle fluctuations here with quarter by year effects and local shocks with the city by year effects. Okay? And then we, uh, since it's an individual level panel, we can throw in worker fixed effects and uh, 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 non-parametrically estimate the, um, the age profile of sick leaves here. Now, I told you at the beginning of the presentation that pollution exposure is not random. So even though we can uh, uh, control for a lot of confounders and for sorting bias and perhaps some simultaneity in the outcomes uh, using the time by location fixed effects, uh, we cannot rule out the possibility that there is some remaining endogeneity, and we address that endogeneity with an instrumental variable. So since the uh, pollution outcome that we look at, sorry, the pollution treatment that we look at is particulate matter, PM10, we use as an instrument also PM10, but PM10 from remote sources. In particular, this is PM10 that is blown to Spain from the Sahara. Okay, so this is a, a, a a typical phenomenon in uh, that uh, Saharan dust gets blown to other parts of the world in uh, sort of long range um, atmospheric transport. Um, in our sample, this, is, this happens about once, one in six or seven days is a, is a Saharan dust episode. Uh, and the way this uh, looks like is represented in this graphical rendering here of a pollution event in 2009, where you can see, so this is the Spanish Peninsula here. These are the Balearic Islands, Canary Islands. And then you see this dust cloud build up over Northern Africa. Uh, and then within days, it travels to uh, travels north to cover first uh, the southern part of the peninsula and the Canary Islands. Then uh, soon after, it covers all of Spain. And then at the end of the month, uh, it has retracted, this dust cloud has retracted to, to Northern Africa. So this is a, uh, a valid instrument because it's, it shifts pollution concentrations locally in Spain under these circumstances. You'll see that in the first stage um, later on. And um, the occurrence of this phenomenon has nothing to do with uh, local labor market conditions. So conditioning on whether we argue that these are exogenous to local sick leave rates. Here is the um, central result of the paper. Um, it's the, um, this shows the, um, the effect of uh, uh, exceed high pollution events as measured as the share of exceedance of share of days a week that the standard was exceeded. Um, this is the uh, on the weekly sick leave rate. Uh, this is the OLS estimate, it's positive and statistically significant. The IV estimate right next to it is also positive. It's about three times as large as the OLS estimate, uh, also positive and statistically significant. And uh, this is the first stage that shows that uh, this instrument is, is actually relevant. So um, uh, statistical significance aside, this effect is quite small. So we've scaled these uh, these coefficients up by a factor of 100 for readability. Um, nonetheless, it's economically significant. So in order to convince ourselves, um, we uh, did a back of the envelope calculation where we monetize the economic damage of a workday lost using the average producer wage. So that's meant to proxy the production loss 
uh, if someone stays at home, it's clearly a lower bound because it doesn't account for disutility of, of uh, sickness, for the cost of treatment, or for any long-term health impacts that could arise. But still with that lower bound, we get uh, a, a, an economically significant number if we, in a thought experiment where we uh, enforce a strict compliance with the EU 24-hour standard for PM10 during the sample period. Uh, according to our estimates, that would have saved uh, on the order of 876 million euros in terms of loss production. Okay. So heterogeneous uh, treatment effects are um, important in the literature on air quality uh, and human health um, because uh, it's well known that vulnerable individuals suffer disproportionately from air pollution. So uh, this poses an equity issue um, because it's also true that there are no close substitutes for good health. So if some people suffer disproportionately from polluted air and we cannot fix the problem, we cannot clean up the air, uh, we have very imperfect ways of compensating those individuals um, because we cannot offer good substitutes for the health that they lose due to um, air pollution. So that's one motivation to study um, who is actually suffering most from the, uh, from the air pollution. In our context, there's a new twist because we have um, a behavioral outcome that we look at, um, namely the decision to take a sick leave. Now, this is an active choice that people can make. Uh, they wake up in the morning, they can, they can decide whether to go see the doctor, stay at home, or drag themselves to work, right, even though they feel sick. Um, and so that decision will not only depend on the pollution shock that they suffer, excuse me, uh, that they suffer, but it will also depend on the incentives provided by employment contracts and sickness insurance. And this is uh, one of the new aspects of our paper is to look into that issue. Um, we started uh, taking a step on that by um, regressing our model or estimating our model separately for different contract types. Uh, and as you see here, uh, temporary contracts that have very low employment protection. Uh, Spain is known for that um, phenomenon. Um, it's a uh, dual labor market where the temporary workers uh, have a very low employment protection. People with a permanent contract have very high employment protection. And then, of course, they have some civil servants. Uh, and what we found here was that the impact of air pollution on sick leave um, taking behavior increases with uh, uh, across these categories in line with higher job security. So people who have higher job security tend to take this more seriously and stay at home when, uh, when pollution hits. And so this is uh, the basis for a hypothesis uh, that we then wanted to test for the broader sample somehow, which is that that the propensity to call in sick increases with job security. In order to properly test that, we should uh, disentangle uh, the job security aspect from all the other uh, attributes of an occupation that are kind of uh, confounded here in these categories, temporary contract permanent versus civil servants, right? Um, uh, when you go to a bar, it's not going to be a civil servant who's going to wait your table usually. Right? So these are other aspects that we want to um, tease out here and just reduce it to the job security aspect. And we do that by means of a, a, an auxiliary logit regression that we run for our entire model at the worker level um, to predict the individual risk of job loss for each worker in an initial stage. And then we interact that prediction with pollution to um, have a more clear-cut test of whether uh, in unemployment risk influences the propensity to take a sick leave. The resulting uh, regression is shown here, where here we have our baseline estimate. Uh, this is the IV uh, regression. The baseline estimate, and this is the interaction term, which comes out as uh, statistically significant and negative. So this regression confirms our hunch that it might indeed be unemployment risk that is driving this um, negative correlation in the previous, found in the previous table. Okay, so I'm almost at the end of my time. 
So the so to summarize and perhaps speculate a little bit. Um, so let me start with the summary. Uh, we find that higher concentration of particulate matter causes a significant increase in sick leaves. Uh, and we also find um, that the treatment effect is smaller for workers uh, who face a high risk of losing their jobs. And now this is the speculative part. Uh, so the explanation that we'd like to uh, give is that uh, this presenteeism among high risk workers is a consequence of their fear of getting laid off in the future, right? They, they're, they're not very, uh, their, their jobs are not highly protected. They can get laid off any time. Uh, so you better signal to your employer that you're in good health and that you will continue to be productive uh, for the firm rather than staying home sick all the time. Uh, and uh, there's a consequence to that because um, the failure to seek adequate treatment not only decreases the productivity of the workers in the short run, but it might also lead to poorer health in the long run uh, and that might lead to um, to higher healthcare expenditures uh, for, the, for the economy at large. So that's all I wanted to um, tell you about my research and I thank you for your attention and um, look forward to your questions. Thank you very much Ulrich. So we have time for questions. Uh, you, you, know the gate, you know the score by now folks. Uh, either put your hand up uh, or uh, type it in the chat box. So Elena, you have a question, please go ahead. Uh, I actually have two. The first one is a silly one though, Ulrik. Why is, it, is this all that you wanted to tell us? I wanna know more. That's the first question. <laughs> no, but the second one, um, the, the actual question is the following. Um, I think that specifically part of what you presented here raises concern about the design of a given uh, policy instrument, namely let's, uh, let's talk for instance about the EU ATS, which is uh, designed to monitor CO2 emissions, right? As opposed to designing instruments that take into account more than one pollutant. And I, I mean, I understand that there is, it, it's clear to all of us that it's difficult to do um, to, to do it in that way, but my point uh, is the following. What would be, I mean, uh, did you spend, uh, were you able to spend any time thinking about what the, uh, what the insights from your research and how the insights from your research could actually feed into some policy advice with respect to how to design these instruments or how to mitigate unintended effects or how to control, I mean, wh what should a government official do after he's read this paper? You know, um, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to figure out whether there is a way to turn what I think are very crucial results, right, in an actionable tool that can help speed up the, the, the transition in a certain sense. Yeah, thanks for a very uh, thoughtful question. So um, in sticking with the great economics tradition, let me answer with the two magic words, it depends. Uh, but uh, no, it, it depends. I mean, this is, in the first place, this is about measurement, right? So we know, that, you know you can go back to economics textbooks uh, four decades ago, and there's the mention almost four decades ago, there's a mention of a multi pollutant issue and how we should price. You can find that in Bomo and Oates, and how we should price in the presence of multiple pollutants or heterogeneous damages. And I think we here we have this big policy experiment uh, for CO2 pricing. And um, we're, uh, you know, it's the only game in town, essentially. Uh, this is what it looks like now. So we should better understand it. We should understand what are the implications for, for local air quality in all the uh, European countries that participate in that. And then once, um, once those damages have been measured uh, properly, uh, we can think about whether it warrants a policy response uh, by saying uh, imputing uh, local prices or uh, introducing exchange rates for permits that go from densely populated to to not densely populated uh, areas and vice versa. Um, there's also the equity issue uh, which is more of a political so that's the, that first aspect is about efficiency uh, so how do we how do we get the the, the 
a bang, the highest bang for, for a buck. But the equity issue would be about, okay, who gets to suffer if there's actually a, a shift in, a significant shift in the, um, in the pollution concentrations due to the ETS, then who is suffering that shift in Europe? And um, how does that feed back into political support for more far-reaching uh, climate policies that maybe ask people for even higher sacrifices than the current CO2 trading under the ETS. Um, so I think that will also be a, a thing worth discussing, especially if you have an eye on the process in California where environmental justice uh, is a huge concern um, in the context of environmental policies and market-based environmental policies above all. Okay, so I've got uh, one hand up from the audience. This is from Umberto Gavador. Uh, Umberto, would you like to unmute yourself and ask a question, please? Hi, Ulrich. Uh, very nice topic, very nice presentation. I was wondering if you have thought about long-term exposure, right? Because what you are picking up here is what's the effect of a peak in pollution. Uh, and that's really connected with the idea of the type of different measures, particularly on, on restricting traffic uh, and the type of, 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 uh, of effects of, of pollution. So can we say anything or have you thought about uh, you know, the idea of long-term exposure to, to pollution rather than peaks? So that's, thanks a lot. No, uh, yeah, I, I mentioned it. Um... Uh, it's, part of a, it's part of a proposal to try and find out about uh, effects of long-term exposure. We have um, the data to look into that, at least you know, over a period of, uh, of 10 years, um, to, to measure uh, pollution exposure at the individual level, to observe people's health at uh, the individual level, um, because we also have uh, information on the diagnosis code um, when they go see the doctor. Um, and so that is that will be part of the agenda to see whether there's any interesting correlations um, and maybe causation that we can prove and find and prove to be there. Okay. So I had a, I had a, a quick question about the IV strategy. So I was wondering, Ulrich, whether this Kalima is associated with particularly hot weather as well as dusty weather. And, and if that's the case, then whether the exclusion restriction could be an issue through the effect of heat on health. Yeah, so um, there's certainly a correlation with weather. Uh, and uh, the closer you get to northern Africa, the stronger, the stronger that is. Um, so I was once uh, uh, on the Canary Islands during a, a Kalima event, and this is actually the, the name uh, as far as I know, is was coined that term was coined on the Canary Islands, where they they are actually exposed to that phenomenon much more. Uh, so two two quick re replies to that. Um, first one is we have weather controls that are we also have sort of nonlinear um, weather controls for uh, all the variables we could get a hold of. Um, including temperature, of course, and precipitation and uh, cloud cover and all these things and wind uh, direction, wind speed. So we try to control for that as, as, uh, as much as possible. And we also um, check that uh, the results are not sensitive to including the Canary Islands or not, just because of their uh, proximity to, um, to the Sahara. Uh, and the rather atypical, compared to the rest of Spain, the rather atypical weather condition during those Kalima periods. And, uh, and the results don't change. So it's not the Canary Islands driving this. Okay, great, thank you. Well, if there are no more questions at this point, we can move into the last part of the session, which is uh, to have a, a panel discussion on the whole um, ERC application process. So uh, I, I guess uh, I could um, just get this started by asking, uh, asking you to, to give a, a, an overview of the whole process. I mean, roughly how long does it take and what are the key milestones? I at least have never um, applied for one of these things, so I don't know about that. So I wonder whether 
Emanuele, since you since you spoke a while back, whether I could pick on you to, to start us off and just give us a feel for how the whole thing works. Um, well, let me let me try to be brief. Essentially, there is a there is a deadline that is uh, usually set um, a few months before. You know, in the case of the starting grant, for instance, it's always around uh, October. Uh, you don't know the exact dates until the summer. And um, yeah, uh, in my case, um, I decided to try to go for the ERC probably more than one year in advance. So um, I decided that I would apply not at the following one, but uh, at the, in, in one year of time, uh, because I needed to um, get my application together. And, um, and then I started working uh, probably um, three months uh, before and uh, it took me a long time to get it right and um, you know various drafts and feedbacks from uh, from colleagues and then you submit um, then what happens is that you wait a few months uh, you have to submit uh, two um, documents one is a short document um, which is evaluated by the by the panel and then uh, if you pass the second stage, then uh, a second document, which is supposed to be a more technical document, is sent to external reviewers in your field. Because the, the panel is very interdisciplinary. In, the, in case of SH, SH2, which was my panel, it is particularly interdisciplinary. But even uh, in SH1, which is uh, more economics, where Ulrich was, then you have the labor economists, the environmental economists, and this and that. So then the, the technical document is sent uh, to, um, to the reviewers. And uh, if you move to this stage, then you go to the interview, which in our case happened around uh, May or June. And um, yeah, and uh, there you have the panel in front of you. They have the feedbacks from the experts in your field. They have also their own opinion and they kind of bombard you with as many questions as possible for 25 minutes and then you go away and a few months back uh, a few months after you you get the result these are the main stages i would say one of the things i'm hearing there is that you know it, it, this is obviously a really competitive funding scheme it sounds like you made a decision very early on to go for it and so, you know, it needs quite a lot of time to, to develop a, a good proposal. I, let me bring in Elena and Ulrich here. Is, is that your impression as well? That this, you know, you, you can't over prepare for this. Uh, no, you can never over prepare. You're probably always going to feel before you walk into that room, if you make it, that you are uh, grossly under prepared, no matter how it goes in the end. At least this was my experience. I think that in addition to what Emanuele said, um, uh, one, one piece of information, which is as a result of COVID this year, the, the next uh, uh, deadline for the starting grant is actually, I think, around March 2021. So we will skip 2020. Um, this has happened, I think, once before, which was when we passed from FP7 to H2020. It was the other one year when the deadline of the starting grant was in March. Um, so uh, the other part, uh, so as I was mentioning, what I would add to that is that I think that this is, uh, I mean, at least the way in which I was trained to go about this, uh, and I mean trained because uh, I work with people, I know for I work with four ERC grantees, right? So you you sort of rely on, of pre, on previous experience. You ask them how to go about this. There is also a, a considered, in my case, there was also a considered strategic, uh, um, strategic, a series of strategic considerations, right? So once you decide that you have an idea, there is also, you need to worry, um, uh, very systematically, I think. I think it doesn't hurt to worry systematically about uh, uh, the panel. Okay, the possible panel of people. Uh, there are rules, so there are panelists. Are um, uh, the panel? The panel is composed of different people, one year in and one year out. So they they rotate, right? And each of them has different composition. You need to decide whether you want to apply. Uh, for for my case, it was either SH1 or SH2, uh, and and there are some strategic considerations there as well. Uh, specifically, SH1 is is very being the economics panel is very strong. If you have something that is more borderline, like in my case, I have um, uh, quite a significant uh, uh, role of integrated assessment models, which are not traditional economic tools. I have a specific focus on policy, so SH2 was the better choice. 
was deemed to be the better choice, okay? And then, and so th this, these are type of considerations that you don't read in the um, guidelines for application. I mean, you read them, but you don't understand the, the depth of what they mean. So my suggestion is, uh, if anybody's thinking about this, to familiarize themselves with the process, and this you can get from the guidelines, you know, what Emanuela was describing pretty well, um, but then really try and put in some effort to try and understand these mechanisms, which are not perhaps uh, uh, um, open knowledge. There is a knowledge people are willing to share, but you need to go search for it, basically. That's what I'm trying to say. So Ulrich, let me bring you in here. So you 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 have a consolidator grant, but is it is it the same same story really? Uh, yeah, I think I mean the basic uh, the basic uh, setup of of the application process is very similar. It's just a different academic age tier that is targeted. Um, I just uh, yeah. So one one aspect about timing, uh, which is perhaps more relevant to the consolidator, but also to the ones who consider applying to a starting grant and they're close to the seven years out rule. Um, I mean, to me, um, I apply. I applied in the very last year I could, um, and in hindsight, I felt that was a stupid decision. I mean, I, I got away with it, but it would have been really silly to get. A positive evaluation like a revise and resubmit right which happens you don't get the grant uh, and you, you just miss it by a little bit you can go back with the referee reports and submit the thing again which you, which you may if your initial evaluation is high enough um, there's also a penalty if you submit a really bad proposal you you have to wait um, uh, before you can apply again, but suppose you you're in that scenario where you, where you just hit a very competitive year and you 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 miss out on the grant, then having the option with not too much additional work to submit that again, enter the lot enter the lottery again, uh, that's a good option. I, I would definitely recommend to keep that in mind and not do as I did, write the proposal in the last year. And that's that may be coming back to your question, Simon. Maybe even more relevant uh, for me at the consolidated tier because uh, once you're out of those that 12 year window from the phd uh, you end up competing with the advanced tier which is a whole different uh, pool of applicants uh, right so that's extremely extremely competitive right and about the panel choice i wanted to say perhaps that people um, so i was considering I was unsure, and I was especially I wasn't sure whether I should um, do this uh, uh, applying to two panels, this interdisciplinary thing. Uh, and then people um, who were on the evaluation committee uh, at some point, they told me, you know, they dis you know they disadvised from that. So they they told me don't do it, and I I think that was good advice. So maybe I'll I'll just share that uh, with you guys. Um, because in the end, it doesn't make, I don't think it makes your life easier, right? I mean, you, you end up uh, having to convince two panels and the heterogeneity, even with economics, uh, is already, even in SH1 is, is so large that to get everyone or to get, to get a sufficient number of votes uh, is, is, I guess, is hard enough, uh, even if you target a more homogeneous group, if you target two panels, uh, it may be impossible. But I don't think it's impossible, but it may be harder. Great, thanks. Now, let me just uh, remind everybody else that please um, put questions in the chat or put your hand up. But, but while we wait, I just want to, 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 to ask a simple question to each of you, which is, uh, what, what was the single hardest thing about the whole application process for you? Uh. I don't, for me, uh, um, I think if I have to take the whole process, um, the whole process, uh, this, the hardest thing was waiting, waiting after the, um, the interview. I mean, all other, all other parts, um, specifically after the interview, but generally speaking, waiting after you know that you are right there on the brink of, you know, making it or not making it. The previous part, waiting for the first, uh, you know, feedback, you sort of like go in with the idea, I mean, this is really competitive. In my case, uh, for instance, I, I did exactly what Ulrich suggested. I applied two years before the deadline, the final deadline. And the reasoning for this is that I was not going to put in a, 
an application that I wasn't sure about, but in case it would go really, really wrong, I would have another chance of resubmitting two years down the line. Most of the people that I know never got it at their first shot. So um, it, it, it was a consider, and I was advised in this way as well from uh, you know the people that have gone through. So I, I would totally second that if possible. Um, again, without uh, just submitting for the sake of submitting, because this is one of the most uh, I think one of the hardest. Uh, um, the the acceptance rate is actually very very low. You can do a little bit of back of the envelope calculation, but for me, waiting was really hard. It's because you're there and you feel like you could have done so much better in so many ways in a certain sense you also feel that you did the best that you could so that a month and a half or whatever um, um, however much time passed for me was was really um it was a, a, a trying time let me put it that way and then if i had to pick a second one simon sorry the second one is when you realize they gave you the money and then you got to do all that you put on paper that was the second biggest part in which i'm still in right now i have to say so <laughs> That's the thing with all grants, but some more than others, I think. So, um, uh, Emanuele, the, the single hardest thing. Um, I guess, let me say two things uh, briefly. The first one is uh, preparing the, um, the documents, the, the application. Um, in a way, I was maybe underestimating because in the year previous uh, to the to the application, I had submitted already some funding applications, and I thought I was kind of ready. Whoops. Emma. Uh, looks like his connection's gone a bit flaky. Let's just wait a few seconds, otherwise I'll uh, ask Ulrich if you don't mind jumping in. Okay, he's fallen out. So, um, Ulrich, can, what, was, what was the hardest thing for you? Um, the hardest thing for me was uh, to actually pull it, pull it, pull it off the writing in the uh, from the time I decided to actually go for it uh, until the deadline, I was just because I'm I guess I'm older than, <laughs> than the other two. Uh, it was just physically demanding because I put in a lot of hours. I mean that's no, there's no, don't kid yourself. It's a lot of work. Even if you have your ideas, if you think you have your ideas straight, the whole writing process makes you think think uh, again. Uh, because you give it to someone to read, which I also recommend, and it turns out that if you don't have your ideas as straight or you didn't put them on paper in that way, so many long days and, and nights spent on that. So that was physically exhausting, but it was also fun. Good, good. Um, Emma, we did just uh, we just switched around while you fell out. Yeah, fell. you did well. I don't know what happened. Um, actually, I think uh, my point was very similar to Ulrich, uh, meaning that despite having this preparation, when I sat down and started thinking about the ERC application, and it's also a matter of, of the budget that you have, especially in social sciences. If you go for the full amount, you really need to have like a whole castle, uh, a whole vision uh, prepared, right? You need to do this and that and that other thing. And uh, you need to also explain how you need to do it. So that took some time, some, some large amount of hours. And the other thing is for the, for the interview, uh, I think I struggled with um, the possible questions coming my way. Um, and I ended up, you know, with a document of 30 pages of possible questions because I went uh, um, and did mock interviews at, uh, with you at the LSE as well. And I was recording everything and then putting. So I went into the room quite prepared, uh, but still they asked me questions that I was not expecting that I, I didn't prepare for. Okay. So that, that was quite challenging. That's really interesting. I'd potentially pick up on that again in a few minutes, but I've got a question from the audience from Matthias. Uh, Matthias, would you like to unmute yourself and ask that question now? Hi, yeah, sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, hi, hi everybody. Um, so I, I, Ulrich, sorry, I missed your presentation. I had to, I had to leave, but I saw the, the first two ones and, and uh, they were both very interesting, but one of the things that I found striking, and I've written one previous uh, grant application for, for a national uh, grant agency, and, and what I did for that, for that proposal was, was literally lists like papers I would write, and, and, and they were basically three or four research papers fitted together around a team, and I said, these, these are the papers that are going to be the output of, of, of my work. Well, if 
I saw your both presentations, they were almost like endeavors into, into new areas where I, listening to the proposal, uh, like you described it, that, that it's difficult to, to outline um, specific like research papers that would roll out of it. So in, in, the, in the process of writing, how, how, how do you think about successfulness of a proposal and, and the tension between making it broad and making it focus towards research outputs? Would would like to hear a little bit about that. If, if I may, hi Matthias. Um, good to hear you. Um, I think um, the 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 trade-off that you have in the proposal. I mean, now you've seen the presentations. So the presentations are, at least in my case, the the first part was based on the seven or eight minutes I had at the ERC. So that's not really representative of what the proposal looks like, but. In the proposal, you you wanna you wanna use as much space uh, as you can to convince the the evaluators that this, that that you're about to do groundbreaking research. So I think that's the only criterion, no matter broadness or or folk, you know whether you you focus on on some broad issues or 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 you go very deep into a particular literature, as long as it's relevant to the world and or highly relevant and, and breaks new ground scientifically uh, I think um, that's the only constraint and then what ties you to the ground is that you also have to demonstrate the feasibility right so you cannot just uh, promise castles in the uh, in the sky but uh, you need to demonstrate that what you propose is feasible and, and so that's I think that's the balance you need to strike if I may add up on, on top of this, I think, I mean, the, the characterizing um, aspect of an ERC is that they want high risk, high reward research. This is not what normally people would fund in other contexts like national grants and whatever. So the point, I think I totally second what, what Ulrich is saying. You need to be doing groundbreaking research. You need to convince them that, that you're proposing groundbreaking research and uh, that you're not taking risks, uh, uh, you know, uh, unnecessary risks. But the point is that you really need to show that you're trying to advance the, the frontier of science. This is what I have been told over and over again. So the approach that you were, you know, talking about before, which may work on a national, um, uh, national funding agency, is not what they're looking for necessarily, you know, when you want a reliable plan. And so, for instance, I work a lot on H2020 FP7 projects, and it's a completely different way of approaching an application, right? Because you need to somewhat really uh, com combine feasibility, which is still crucial, with some ways of pushing forward the frontier. So I, I think this is also a very, a very hard part. And I think this is also what uh, Emanuele was uh, alluding to before, right? When, you're, when he was talking about the fact that he had presented perhaps uh, previous applications, but still there is work to do to adapt this previous application in the ERC context is really crucial. And um, uh, yeah, so I don't know if... Regarding the broadness, sorry, just one point. Regarding the broadness and the specificity, I don't think it, I don't think that you will be picked because a project is very specific or because the project is very very broad. In my case, what was hard is that I had this um, very broad approach in terms of why it was relevant, and then I made the specific choice on of making it uh, actionable by focusing on three specific technologies. If you look at, for instance, three D printing, three D printing is a microscopic uh, area of digitalization in industry. All right, but I needed to convince them in some way that I could do it. And that was the way I chose to do it. And not necessarily perhaps the best one. And lastly, ERCs are also those grants where you have a little bit of room for maneuver because after you sign the grant, uh, provided you are within the scope of the research, you are actually not necessarily bound in the same way as you're bound in other projects. So you can change, you can be, you can be steered uh, in research, uh, depending on where the said research takes you. These are very peculiar traits of this program, I think, that are very unlike whatever else people apply for other, in other places. In the EU, I'm talking about, I, I don't know about abroad. Yeah, okay. Um, well, um, thanks, uh, Matthias. Thank you very much. Yeah. Emanuele, I don't know if you want Come in on that. It's fine if you don't. Um, no, I think uh, Ulrich and Elena really represent uh, my, my thoughts. Yeah. So I wanted to. One of the things I wanted to to, to pick up on was was the interview. So um, 
Yeah, so to, I mean, to what extent, I know that you've spoken a little bit this, a little bit about this already, Emanuele, but to what extent were the interview questions uh, according to your expectations? Mm. And to what extent were they not? And if they weren't, was there, did it reveal a systematic bias in your expectations? So I'd like to hear from both of you about this. Yeah, well, the, the second question, I don't know about systematic biases, but um, no, I mean, I have to be honest, they were more or less in line with my expectations, but that's only for one reason, because I um, did these mock interviews. I did several here at my institution and uh, at other institutions with friendly colleagues, uh, even with, uh, with uh, my partner, you know, because you need to be able to explain things uh, to an audience that not doesn't necessarily understand what you're saying, you need to still come to convince them that it's it's groundbreaking and it's you're the right person to do it. So these uh, questions, I accumulated them and then I rehearsed them, rehearsed them, rehearsed them, and then when I went in, yes, the the questions, some questions were actually different, and then I realized that they were based on the feedbacks uh, of the technical um, experts. In my case, I had, I think, uh, eight reviews. Uh, most of them were very positive. There was one that was uh, skeptical in, in some parts, right? And so they asked me exactly those questions. And um, I guess there you cannot really prepare completely, uh, but you need to essentially be prepared enough to feel confident that whatever comes your way, you will be able to say, uh, yes, I will, I will tackle this in, in this specific way. I have thought about it. That's, I guess, that the, the message that they want to hear, that you will be able to, um, that you are aware of your limitations, because of course you have them, and but you have a, a, a plan on how to tackle this. All right. Um, Ulrich, how was the interview for you? Did, it, did, did you get questions you were expecting or was it a bit yeah, late? So in SH1, I think it was 17 minutes. And so that means that almost half of it was my own presentation. So I realized your question was about the other half. Um, so about the questions, I think they were in line with what was to be expected from a, a general you know, economics and business audience. Um, it's also true that as far as I remember, many questions were based on the, on the expert reports, uh, at least in the first half of the interview, and then in the second half, things sort of branched out. Uh, and then there were also questions about the presentation itself. And, you know, when you walk, I mean, at least when I walked out there, I wasn't able to tell whether I answered well or not. <laughs> so that's a typical exam situation. But the, the first part, which is the, the presentation, um, that's also quite important because the people are going to vote on the proposal and many of the jurors will only see you, you know, there. They may not know your proposal in detail. They, you know, for sure not everyone knows your proposal in detail. Um, so it's that impression that counts as well. Uh, and the way I prepared for that was to attend um, uh, a training session, which was offered by the, the, the German contact point, uh, which I can just highly recommend. I think that was very useful. I did two of those and, and there were decreasing, de decreasing returns, but um, the first one was very useful and brings you together with other, um, also people from other fields who have experience because they applied already or they already had a starting brand. Uh, and that was a very nice uh, way of preparing for that. Even, even if you cannot take the advice literally because, uh, all of the advice literally because it sometimes refers to panels where things are very different from the SH1 or the SH2 panel. But uh, because I attended uh, one of these uh, uh, events as well, that, that was also very useful for me. And uh, I was actually the only economist, the others were physicists and other, but still there are some, uh, some dimensions that uh, you can reapply to your own uh, panel and your own uh, situation. And uh, also seeing others prepare is super useful because you see things that you like, things that you don't like. So it kind of steers you in the right direction. 
Elena, perhaps uh, I can give the last word to you as, as time begins to run out. So how was, how was the interview for you? Did you get questions you expected or not? Um, I'm a little bit scared of saying what I'm about to say, but uh, it, it's the truth, so I, I, I shall say it. I actually just got questions that I expected, and I actually um, was lucky enough, uh, lucky enough, I mean, I, I think I put a lot of effort into preparing um, to, to know who potentially could be on my panel. So basically, I got the questions that I expected from the people that I expected, I have to say. So, and that is, uh, um, I think it's a great component of luck as well, but I read at least two papers from each of the people that asked me a question in the, in the room. So, I don't, I don't know. I think it was a great component of, I mean, I, I did my, my job, I, I clearly, but I went back, I mean, I'm a little bit uh, anal in these things, you know, I'm just, uh, <laughs> just detail oriented, but I went back, I tracked. ERC panels for the past 10 years. I looked at how they switch from one year in and off, what their background was. So I knew I had to have a geographer, a legal person, an historian, you know, on SH2 and all this type of stuff. I made sure that I read papers from these people as well. And I have to say that this for me was not so much. I don't think, I think that you, it's enough to have clarity of mind when you get in. Uh, believe it or not, six minutes for questions when they ask you six questions is actually a very short time. So you need to answer very fast. Right, so this is, to me, it's the crucial thing to have. But for me, the way I am in character, um, realizing as I walked in that I sort of knew, you know, the areas or uh, it made me feel uh, better. It, it helped me deal with stress. I'm not sure that it would work the same for other people or, you know, and, and again, I was really lucky in that, but I did put a lot of effort into doing my background research before I walked into that door. Well, uh, I think that certainly the one thing that comes out very clearly is how much the three of you worked hard for this. And so uh, if we didn't know it before, we, we certainly know now how much you deserve it. So congratulations again from me and from everybody. I'm sure I speak for everybody to, in saying congratulations. Um, time is almost up, everyone, so uh, let me uh, take this opportunity to thank you for uh, coming along to listen to the talks and also to thank uh, our speakers, uh, Emanuele Campillo, Elena Verdolini and Ulrich Wagner uh, for their contributions. Uh, and uh, so that just leaves me to say thanks again and uh, have a great afternoon. Thank you, Simon. Thank you, Simon, and ask to say thank you, Simon. No problem. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.